Over the next six lectures, we will examine the nature and history of money, banking, and credit, including the history of various proposals for changes in laws and institutional arrangements governing these critical elements of our systems of political economy. This first lecture is titled Old World Origins. I'm Edward J. Dodson. The arguments over what constitutes a just system of money and credit and banking have been going on for, well, several thousand years. We will now examine some of this history of how money came into use and how its use and abuse contributed to the growth and collapse of societies throughout the ancient and modern eras. The American political economist Henry George offered this definition of money as he saw its role in the political economy of nations. He wrote, Money is a general medium of exchange, the common flow through which wealth is transformed from one form to another. Thinking of money as a medium of exchange and not as wealth presents a wide range of analytical challenges with important legal and policy implications. As we continue, we will cover these issues. Throughout history, everything from cattle, beads, salt, barley, whiskey, and tobacco served as a medium of exchange. Commodity money circulated based on wide acceptance and scarcity. In some cases, the commodity was valued as money because of the high amount of labor required to produce the commodity. Touchstones have been used for thousands of years as a way to test the purity of soft metals. Evidence of their use has been found as long ago as 2600 BC in the Indus Valley and also in ancient Greece. The touchstone allowed one to quickly determine the content of a particular metal in a coin or raw metal. From this point on, gold and silver, although relatively scarce, spread around the entire globe as standard forms of money. An important characteristic was the fact that they are virtually indestructible. Early coins were subject to counterfeiting, that is, debasement. Stamping of coins with shapes made counterfeiting more difficult. However, coins could still be shaved to produce a small amount of raw metal, eventually producing enough new metal to mint a new counterfeit coin, so additional innovations were needed. In the 700s, the king of the Franks standardized coinage. One Roman pound was minted into 240 silver coins. The most common silver coin was the penny or denier. A penny was sufficient to purchase seven loaves of bread. In response, issuers of coinage added one new important feature. Coins with ridged edges could no longer be shaved, thus preventing the debasement of the coinage. It is worth noting that this innovation also prevented kings and princes from shaving the coins taken in as land rents and taxes. A powerful state, such as the Roman Empire, could mandate use of copper or even wood coins. Roman power assured its coinage was accepted as legal tender, and the coinage was needed to pay ground rents for leased land, for dwellings, for taxes, and for tribute to Rome by people seeking to prevent invasion or direct control by Rome. As in other ancient civilizations, the first appearance of banking activities occurred in the temples. Wealthy Romans deposited their gold and silver coinage in temples for safekeeping. The temple of Saturn in Rome contained Rome's public treasury. Roman citizens could borrow money from the temples at interest. Merchant counting houses also engaged in money changing of foreign coinage for Roman currency as well as lending activity. Bills of exchange were in common use by the Greek city-states, expanding as Rome became the dominant economic power throughout the Mediterranean, enabling bank balances of merchants regularly doing business with one another to be transferred on the bank records without the actual physical movement of coinage. As different forms of money served as effective mediums of exchange, 
Such exchanges often involve the extension of credit by one party providing a good or service to another party. Credit meant that payment in money, goods, or services was not immediate. Thus, credit is something one extends to another for some period of time and under terms generally understood or negotiated. From the fall of the Western Roman Empire, a gradual expansion of feudal manors led to a decline in money circulation. The lords of the feudal manors took a share of crops from peasants in lieu of money rents and taxes, for the simple reason that few people had coinage. Peasants engaged in barter, but had little in surplus to trade. Then came the Crusades. In 1204, the Fourth Crusade began. The Christian armies of Europe sacked Constantinople and returned home with huge quantities of precious stones, gold, and silver. And when the European princes and knights returned home, the gold and silver they brought with them set the stage for replacement of feudal arrangements with cash and credit-driven markets. Peasants were now increasingly required to sell their crops for cash, from which they paid ground rents and taxes to the feudal landlords. Feudal obligations broke down, and the peasants assumed the risks of a failed crop or insufficient prices for what they sold. Failure to pay rents or taxes resulted in removal from the land, seeking wage work from an expanding class of landlords, or moving into the towns in search of work. The end of the Crusades left many European princes holding new estates in the eastern Mediterranean. Trade was renewed, and the flow of coin money created a need for merchant bankers. Blessed by their locations, Venice and Genoa became major centers of Mediterranean commerce. Florence emerged as a center of banking. The Bardi and Peruzzi families were dominant in Florence in the 14th century and established branches in other parts of Europe to facilitate their trading activities. Both of these banking families extended substantial loans to Edward III of England to finance the 100 Years' War against France. But Edward defaulted, and the banks failed. About 1429, Jacques Cuer formed a commercial partnership with two brothers named Goddard. In 1432, he was in Damascus purchasing goods for shipment back to France. Four years later, Courier was appointed master of the Paris Mint and to other high offices. By 1450, he was, by many estimates, the wealthiest Frenchman. This is his estate in Paris. Unfortunately for him, a year after its completion, he was accused of poisoning an aristocratic woman and arrested, his property confiscated by the king. He had apparently generated jealousy among powerful court attendants. He later escaped and made his way to Rome, where history loses track of his activities. In 1491, and again in 1505, the Fugers made loans to Maximilian, secured by the feudal rights to two Austrian counties. In 1519, the bankers then financed the campaign of Maximilian's grandson, Charles, to be elected emperor. However, by the end of the 16th century, the family withdrew from financial risk-taking after some disastrous ventures and settled into an aristocratic existence. They had, by the early 16th century, already come to control much of the European economy. Their interests included silver and copper mines, trade in spices, wool, and silk. The Medici family emerged as banker to the Catholic Church in the early 15th century, collecting tithes from church members. The Medici refrained from making loans to princes and kings, known to be very poor risks, and so remained profitable until its London operation violated this business model and made loans to Edward IV, whose treasury was emptied by the War of the Roses. However, the Medici family's assets were taken over by the Fugger family. Jacob Fugger, a merchant, acquired significant wealth by marrying the daughter of a goldsmith. By 1461, he was one of the richest men in the country. His son, Ulrich, then fostered a strong relationship with the Habsburgs. 
A family member in Rome also took over handling remittances to the papal court, leasing the mint in Rome from 1508 to 1515. In southern Germany, the Fugger family financed the House of Habsburg. They made their first loan to a Habsburg Archduke in 1487, taking as security an interest in silver and copper mines. Because of its strategic location and liberal economic policies, the Netherlands became, in the 16th century, Europe's great financial center. Coinage and bullion from all around the world passed through the hands of Amsterdam merchants. The Dutch were the world's most efficient shipbuilders at the time, enabling them to dominate world commerce. The need for a strong banking sector brought about the next important innovation. The stage was now set for the development of the first modern banking institutions. The Bank of Amsterdam was founded as a deposit bank, protected by the city of Amsterdam. The bank took in both foreign and local coinage, which was reminted, as well as gold and silver bullion. After taking a small minting and management fee, depositors were credited for the balance. Thus was established the first full reserve banking operation with receipts, certificates of deposit, circulating as a primary form of currency. Historian Emanuel Wallerstein describes the importance of this new financial institution. It quickly became the great center of European deposit and exchange because it provided a security and convenience rare in the annals of 17th century banking. Over the century, deposits rose from under 1 million to over 16 million florins, and it became the place of retreat for owners of capital who feared for the safety of their wealth. Once enough bullion and coin was deposited, Amsterdam held the key, so to speak, to Europe's international payment system. From the great Scottish political economist and moral philosopher Adam Smith, we learn of the chaotic conditions existing before the Bank of Amsterdam was established. Smith wrote, Before 1609, the great quantity of clipped and worn foreign coin which the extensive trade of Amsterdam brought from all parts of Europe, reduced the value of its currency about 9% below that of good money fresh from the mint. Such money no sooner appeared than it was melted down or carried away, as it always is in such circumstances. The merchants, with plenty of currency, could not always find a sufficient quantity of good money to pay their bills of exchange and the value of those bills, in spite of several regulations which were meant to prevent it, became in a great measure uncertain. And then the Bank of Amsterdam began doing business, Smith continues. In order to remedy these inconveniences, a bank was established in 1609 under the guarantee of the city. This bank received both foreign coin and the light and worn coin of the country at its real intrinsic value in the good standard money of the country, deducting only so much as was necessary for defraying the expense of coinage and the other necessary expense of management. For the value which remained after this small deduction was made, it gave a credit in its books. This credit was called bank money, which as it represented money exactly according to the standard of the mint, was always of the same real value and intrinsically worth more than current money. Unfortunately, by the mid-1600s, the Committee of City Government officials who administered the bank's operations began allowing depositors to overdraw their accounts. Later still, the bank extended large loans to the Dutch East India Company and to the municipality of Amsterdam, loans exceeding the bank's own assets and then the total money held on behalf of its depositors. The era of full deposit banking was over. The era of widespread financial speculation had arrived. In an effort to regain solvency, the officers of the bank engaged in speculations in the tulip market, resulting in even greater losses when the tulip market crashed. 
Even so, the bank's role as intermediary in the global economy enabled it to survive until dissolved in 1796. However, by the mid-1600s, the experiment with full reserve banking ended. The Bank of Amsterdam's importance was eventually eclipsed by the Bank of England, which financed Britain's bid for a global colonial empire. The bank was chartered in 1694 with specie, that is hard money, raised from investors. This specie was then loaned to the British government. Nonetheless, the bank was permitted to issue banknotes equal to its original specie, with redemption guaranteed by the government. The era of fractional reserve banking as the common practice had arrived. The global economy now entered a long period of fractional reserve banking. By the early 18th century, Britain was on a gold standard formalized in 1821. Other countries, including the United States, followed Britain. Banks were required by law to hold on deposit gold coinage equal to some percentage of bank notes printed and loaned or spent into circulation. The central banks acted as lenders of last resort in the event member banks could not meet the demands for cash by depositors. The system worked well enough so long as a general panic did not result in a widespread demand by depositors for their gold coinage. In this early modern era, the family that rose in prominence as bankers was founded in the late 18th century by Meyer Amschel Rothschild, a court factor to the leading aristocratic family of Frankfurt, then within the Holy Roman Empire. Meyer established a finance business and eventually appointed his five sons to manage the family's affairs in London, Paris, Naples, Vienna, and Frankfurt. The business grew from trading in goods and foreign exchange to include merchant banking, private banking, asset management, mergers and acquisitions, insurance, venture capital, pension management, sovereign debt, and the finance of commodity acquisitions. The family has also invested in major infrastructure projects such as bridges, canals, tunnels, railways, and also provided financing for the construction of the Suez Canal. Nathan Mayer Rothschild set up operations in London. Today, N.M. Rothschild and Sons has some 80 billion euro in assets under management and reported 1.87 billion pounds in revenue in 2019. Competition in banking and finance also came from the Baring family, which provided credit to many corporations during the Industrial Revolution. Part of the family settled in England early in the 18th century. Johann Bering built a flourishing business as a wool exporter and his sons established Bering's Bank in London. The bank grew into a leading merchant bank. Of course, there were other family founded banking dynasties established around the world. Here I have only covered those active on the European continent. A few have survived to continue in operation today. And so we've reached the end of Lecture 1.